I think that the next session that you're going to hear on advocacy is going to share with you not only the challenges that we're facing, but uh, much, much more in that regard. Um, we are also going to look at nutrition and weight management this afternoon. And uh, finally, we'll have a, a session on technology for living with Duchenne, which is fascinating for, for boys as, as they become a little, a little less mobile and so on and so forth. It's going to be a, a great afternoon. So I, I would like to uh, now move to the advocacy session. Uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule. People feel free to grab a beverage or whatever you like, but I, we're going to continue to move forward. Uh, we have... Um, uh, with us, uh, we have Nicola Worsfold from our organization, uh, who, uh, as you know, is, is a Duchenne mom and also has uh, been advocating for her drugs and treatments and, and has a pharmaceutical background, uh, which has been tremendously valuable for us. And we are honored to have uh, from CORD, uh, Durhan Wongreiger. Durhan is internationally recognized as a leader in rare disease. Uh, she works tirelessly. Uh, on this particular area. We have uh, worked together, had the privilege of working with her on the court board for three years. And and uh, I don't know, I think this morning was at seven o'clock, you were speaking with someone in France. And so that is not an unusual day, even though it's a Sunday uh, for Durham. So we appreciate the passion that she brings to rare diseases. I uh, like to uh, just give everybody a minute to grab a beverage and then we will invite up to the stage. Uh, we will invite uh, both Durhain and Nicola. Hello, everyone. Um, so this section of our uh, conference is going to be focused on advocacy. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of time just to update our community on some of the work that Defeat Duchenne Canada has been doing around advocacy. Thank you. Um, but quite honestly, uh, we have Durhan in the room with us, um, who is just an incredible advocate on behalf of the rare disease community internationally. Um, and we're so fortunate to have her with her. She is so passionate about what she does. And, um, you know, she's been here with us all weekend to learn more about Duchenne, and we're very thankful for that. Um, so I really want to make sure that we have time for, for Durhan because um, she's going to share a lot of really important information with us. Um, so Defeat Duchenne Canada, we are the leading organization representing the Duchenne in Canada. And our goal is to unify our community's voice and diverse needs as we advocate for timely access to the best health care and medications in Canada. And that's very simply why, because Duchenne isn't going to wait, and neither will we. So I just want to give everyone a little bit of an update on some of the work that we've been up to, um, really, um, probably more than just over the last two years, but for quite some time. Uh, one of those areas which we've already heard quite a bit about in the last couple of days is around clinical trials in Canada. And um, the one message that we've heard over and over again is that the landscape for clinical trials, even just treatment development, is just really, really changed over the last 10 years. And, you know, when I first started out and my son was first diagnosed, uh, there were no clinical trials in Canada. In fact, um, the one trial that was in Canada was the Biomoran drug, uh, which had unfortunately failed and was discontinued. And so as a family, we really had to look for options outside of Canada, and we did for quite a number of years, participated in a clinical trial in the United States. Um, but today, there we have 62 active clinical trials worldwide. 15 of those are in Canada, nine of which are in adults. So we've really come a long way. We have also been partnering with like-minded organizations to really provide consultation into the rare disease strategy. Uh, we've done a lot of work partnering um, with many organizations, including CORD, um, to, um, to make sure that, um, you know, our Duchenne voice 
has been part of that consultation and that our needs as a, a Duchenne community are, um, are certainly, um, you know, at the table um, during these conversations, um, including the PMBRE price restrictions. But I'm not going to go into much detail about that because Durhan will do a far better job of updating us on all of that uh, very shortly. And then the last thing I want to mention was, you know, again, we partnered with our multidisciplinary pediatric and adult health healthcare teams across Canada. Uh, and Dr. Campbell spoke a little bit about this yesterday, uh, where we addressed the Duchenne standards of care. And we ran a, a multi-day conference over three days. So, uh, sorry, we had three conferences over two days uh, last year where we addressed many areas of care. And if you remember Dr. Campbell, um, when he gave his talk, he put up that sort of bubble diagram that had the, uh, the patient in the middle and all the different multidisciplinary uh, care around that bubble. And so we really spent a lot of time um, taking a deep dive into that. And we heard from many experts across Canada who spoke on um, you know, cardiac care, resp uh, respiratory care, um, transition from adults or from pediatric to adult care and so on. We are working on a publication right now because there's just so much um, really great information that came out of that conference. We want to be sure that we do share that publicly and so that is something that you will um, hopefully be seeing in the uh, coming year. Um, I just wanted to share again um, for most of you, and again, this has come up today a few times, is around what is the current situation uh, in Canada for Duchenne. And there are currently six medications that are approved outside of Canada. So they're approved some in the US, uh, some in Europe, uh, some in both places. <laughs> Uh, but none of these are yet been approved in Canada. I thought it was kind of interesting too to also um, put up here what the prices are of some of these drugs in these uh, various different countries and sort of what that means from a Canadian perspective. Um, and you can just see by looking at this what our challenge is going to be moving forward. Uh, we have, uh, there are four different exon skipping therapies that are available in the United States. Um, we, we, Brett had come up earlier today, talked about allurin for nonsense mutations, which are available in the United States, um, as well as Inflaza, which is the generic name for, or the, um, sorry, trade name for Deflazacort. Uh, which is available in the United States. Um, of course, we as Canadians here, we get our Deflaza Court through the Special Access Program, which some of us pay um, some money out of pocket for. Uh, in some provinces, they don't need to do that, um, but uh, we do access it through that program currently. And so now I just want to mention, you know, what are some, what is some of the work that we're doing right now? Um, and so over the last, and, and really only been over the last few months when we think about it, <laughs> um, we have established a Defeat Duchenne Canada Ambassador Families. And so these are families from across the country who represent different ages, um, stages and geographies of, uh, across Canada where they have come together and are helping us to do some advocacy. And we're starting off uh, as a small group of which we do plan to expand on, but right now it's a, a smaller group. Um, we are holding our inaugural, inaugural advocacy summit uh, in a couple of weeks um, later this month, um, where we're going to bring these families together. We're going to be talking about a lot of, um, or conveying a lot of information, but learning, really learning from one another as we develop our toolkit that we intend to share more broadly across uh, the country with many more families um, moving forward. But these uh, families right now who have, um, so um, have, have volunteered their time to really help us develop some of these tools um, that we will be sharing with our families moving forward. Um, and then we have our Hill Day. So this is a big event for our organization. This is going to be our first official Hill Day for Defeat Shen Canada. Uh, in, that is also happening that same weekend on the Monday, where we will be meeting with members of Parliament um, on, uh, on the Monday, uh, which is a, a big deal and really exciting for our community. This is the first opportunity for us to start to generate that awareness uh, about Duchenne. 
I also want to mention that within the, the few months that we've been working on this, uh, we've already reached out and had interactions and communications with many MPs that are serving writings for Duchenne families across Canada, and we continue to do that. Um, and I also want to encourage families, if they are interested in talking to their local MPs, uh, to let us know, to, to reach out to us. Um, and we can certainly help, that, uh, help you with that, um, because your voice matters, matters very much. The more voices that we have to contribute to the conversations about Duchenne, the louder and more effective our message is going to be. And we are looking at doing advocacy, not just from the grassroots, but also pressing for change at higher levels of government. Um, and so if you are interested in getting involved, please, please reach out to either myself uh, or to Perry Essler. Um, and like I said, this is, I know there's a lot of families that are interested in, in getting involved in advocacy. And this is something that we are really starting to grow and develop. And we're starting off uh, with a smaller group and we'll be expanding that out to a much larger group uh, next year as well as we get our tools um, and all of our uh, pieces in place. So that's pretty much all I wanted to share. I really want to turn it over to Durhan now because um, she is going to um, inform the community now about some of the work that cord has been doing uh, in this in this space. So thank you so much, Durhan. <laughs> I've heard a lot of people talk about how difficult it was to see over this podium. So I'm going to try to stand a little bit to the side just to start with. Okay. First of all, huge thanks to Perry and to Nicola too for really the opportunity to be here. It really has been a privilege to be with you over these last couple of days and to really not only hear and learn from the expert, but to really, you know, appreciate once more how important um, the patients and the families are to advancing the, the rare diseases in Canada. And we, of course, have been partnering with, with Rick and Nicholas since, what, since the very beginning. I think we've been all uh, kind of joined. And Rick, of course, was on our board of directors when he was still with Jesse's Journey. So we've come a long way together. So this is a great opportunity also. Um, and, you know, part of the question might be asked is, why do people have to do advocacy? I mean, you, don't you think it would be enough that, you know, you're dealing with having to support care for your child who has a rare condition, to be able to navigate the system in terms of the impacts? So what is this about this advocacy? And it's only a little bit, but it's really related to, of course, the fact that many of these therapies are going to be very challenging when they finally do come to market. So I really give a lot of credit to what you're doing now, because quite frankly, if you're not prepared for it, which many, many communities are not, when the therapies come, I think families are often shocked because, you know, you've been watching and waiting, you've been in clinical trials. You expect that when these therapies come, you're going to be able to get access to them. And suddenly you realize it doesn't quite work that way. It doesn't work that way in Canada. It actually doesn't work that way anywhere. And I'm not going to try to kind of go back over why it's so difficult. But certainly, let's focus a little bit in terms of where Canada is at the moment. And what I will say is what I think is a really exciting opportunity right now. Because when you're seeing these therapies coming in, we actually have the opportunity to experience some real transformations in the Canadian, I won't say the whole Canadian healthcare system, but certainly the Canadian approach to rare diseases that can make a significant difference in terms of your being able to get access to the medicines at a time when they're being come, made available and hopefully be able to come of it to Canada as soon as possible, but not without challenges. So you see me here, I said the vision for Canada's new rare drug program. And why do we say that? And I'll go a little bit into it. Some of you will know very well, and some of you have been involved since the very beginning as we've been trying to launch this. And certainly some of your clinicians, including Dr. Campbell and Dr. Liam Ward, who was here you know, previously, have been intimate in terms of our advancing this. So some of you may know, and if you don't know, you know, um, you need to know that the path to patient access to a therapy is very, very long and it's very challenging. If you look on the left there, what you see is how do drugs get to the patients? Well, first of all, you know, they actually have to 
come to Canada in the form of clinical trials. And as you heard, up until somewhat recently, trials for rare disease drugs just don't come to Canada for lots of reasons. Um, in many cases, it's because Canada is a very small, I use the uh, farmer word for it, it's a small market for rare diseases. So oftentimes companies go where they actually are going to be able to launch the drugs and be able to get, you know, get them sold and be able to reimburse quickly. In Canada, because our markets are small, it really is not a top priority in many cases. And companies generally put their clinical trials where they think they're going to be able to launch the drugs as soon as possible. But there are other reasons that put Canada somewhat in the back of the line. And that is really challenging, as you might guess. Um, in part because clinical trials are, are important in order to get expertise from the clinicians in terms of being able to understand and to be able to prescribe these drugs. They're really important in terms of patients who may actually be time limited in terms of when those drugs can become beneficial. So a clinical trial is oftentimes the only way that you're going to be able to get those drugs in a time that makes sense. And clinical trials are really important because they do develop that infrastructure companies will invest in developing the resources in order to make these drugs more widely available so if you're not there to get the clinical trials you're going to be pushed further down the line when these drugs are being brought you know to the community the other thing that's been a challenge i think as you heard is that canada is very very slow in actually paying for these therapies you i mean i think we all appreciate the fact that canada has an amazing healthcare system. Really, we do have a great public health system. I was chasing Natalie out the door there. She comes from Columbus, Ohio. I was actually raised in Columbus, Ohio. I lived there until I was, you know, graduated from high school. We all know that in the US, you know, the healthcare system really depends on how much money you've got. If you've got lots of resources, you get great access to healthcare. You get the very best access to healthcare. If you don't, you have a really big challenge to get access to even very routine health care. I mean, all my family, my husband's family all live in the US and we know people think twice before they even go for routine kinds of visits because there's oftentimes a huge copay. There's oftentimes, we think there are delays, but there may be delays to get ordinary access. But what they do have is they do have specialty clinics. They do have investment in the very best leading edge kinds of therapies. They do have access to, I won't say they have access to better specialists that we have here, because every time I go outside the country and I talk about what we need here, everybody always points to me and say, yeah, but you have the very best specialists. You have the best researchers in Canada, and we do. So we have the people, we don't actually resource them in the same way as they might. So this is the challenge we've got, is that getting therapies into Canada can oft, for rare diseases, can be absolutely a, a challenge. Because our system is really set up to provide for the masses. If you got an ordinary, common kind of a illness, you do really well. If you got something that needs, well, you know that, to get in to see a specialist, to get into seeing somebody that may provide kind of other kinds of comprehensive services, it's oftentimes a long wait. It doesn't actually come easily, it doesn't come without some additional costs. Very recently, um, I think you're mentioning the uh, Patent Medicine Surprises Review Board. The other thing that makes it a real challenge is that we have a system of price controls for drugs in Canada. And you might think that's wonderful. We actually have a system that will control how much, you know, the system will pay for a drug in Canada. But if you think about it from the point of view of the drug manufacturer, if in fact if you've got a country that's going to put very tight price controls on a drug and you've got other countries that are actually willing to pay somewhat more of a responsible reasonable price for a drug and just to be excessive where are you going to go first you're certainly not going to go to the country that is really trying to make it so that the prices are going to be as low as possible. The other reason why you might not is that many countries reference other countries. So everybody looks like buying a car, right? It's like buying anything else that has a global uh, market, you know? You look and see, okay, how much are we paying for this in other countries? And we certainly don't want to be paying, you know, 
it, it, we certainly can't charge any more than it might be in other countries because it's a global market. So when countries look at Canada, when companies look at Canada and they say, okay, you're going to price it really, really low and you're going to make it so that it's really hard, hard to charge what might be a responsible price in terms of getting a return on investment, we're just not going to come to you first. We'll wait until we've served everybody else. And this has been the challenge we've had over the last three years or so where we've been fighting really very restrictive price controls to the point where companies, I don't know if you, you don't probably follow many of the other diseases, where drug companies were just saying, we're not coming. Cystic fibrosis faced a delay for several years of getting the latest therapy in because the company just basically said, it isn't worth our while to come here. And this is the challenge. We don't want to be paying exorbitant prices. We don't want to be paying a whole lot more than any other country, but we don't want to set our prices so very low that companies look at us and say, not interested. And we get that a lot. In fact, you know, I may have it in the slide here. We'll take a look at how many drugs get to Canada. But the other problem we've got, not just in terms of the price control, is that we have a very complicated system for getting drugs paid for in our uh, in Canada. It starts off with obviously going through the pricing. So the first time a drug comes in, it goes immediately over to pricing, and they set what might be a ceiling price. So if a company looks at it and says that doesn't look good, that might be the, that might be enough to stop it goes there and it goes to the regulator, it goes to Health Canada who reviews the clinical trials that you've been hearing about and they make a determination. Do we think, and they are only looking at, do we think the benefits outweigh the risk? Every drug has risk, as you know, and all of your drugs have lots of risk. They all have benefits. Do the benefits outweigh the risk so that, that, we, can sure that, sure that we can make them available? Are they safe? Are the adverse effects so bad that we really cannot approve them? So that's the regulator, right? So that's what the clinical trials do. But after they get through the regulator, they go to a number of other bodies. The, the most, you know, kind of uh, important, at least from the point of view of access, is this one that we call the health, te health technology assessment. Uh, some of you may have heard about the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies and Health in uh, Quebec is INES, the drug, and they say, oh, drug, and they say, what is the actual value of this drug? Shrug. Should we actually be paying for it? And only part of it is around the actual price, but it's a big part of it. Because what they'll look at and say, here's what's proposed in terms of pricing. Do we believe that the amount of benefit that a patient will receive for that drug is worth the price that's being asked for it? Now, you might think, okay, that sounds good. You know, we have a value-based pricing. The problem is the scale that they use to determine whether or not it is worth the price is not something that was ever designed for rare diseases and certainly never designed for muscular dystrophy. So what they do is they take the scale and they use what you might call a generic scale. And they say, okay, we'll use an index that's called a quality adjusted life year. How many additional years of life do you get and how good are those years of life? And we will then make a determination how much we're willing to pay for that. But again, that's based on a very common index. It's not based on an index, certainly for people that have severe, you know, and very compromising conditions. My husband has Parkinson's disease, he's in the wheelchair, he's been in a wheelchair for a number of years. There is no way that one would look at the impact in terms of any therapy improving his quality of life as meeting the kinds of standards that the common drug review will put into place. So it's an automatic, you know, kind of strike. In fact, we see many times, even when a drug gets approved by this um, quality uh, valuation uh, agency, they will say, we will approve it, but we're going to ask the company to give us a big discount. And we see the discounts that are up to 90, 95%. So you can imagine again, where companies are thinking about, here's the drug, here's what we want. You saw some of the pricing there. I mean, Yes, we can ask for a discount. It's like going in and negotiating for a car, right? I mean, if you go in and they say, okay, the car is $50,000, and you go in and say, I'd like to offer you $15,000, I'd like to offer you maybe $5,000 for it. How much conversation do you think you're going to have with that salesman? It just isn't going to happen. And I think these are the kind of challenges that we're facing, where again, what we're putting on there is really so, so low that companies cannot actually do it. Or we see what else happens is that they negotiate, and the negotiations, instead of taking a few months, can take a few years, and can take a few more years. And we see drugs that have been approved, that have been approved for actually being made available to patients, taking sometimes up to seven years. Now, you can imagine what that might be like to know that you've got a drug, we think it works, the benefits outweigh the risk, 
your child may be eligible for that drug. And by the way, it's actually approved for reimbursement, but the pricing is set in such a way that it might take up to seven years for you to get access to that drug. Now, in some cases, maybe it doesn't make a difference if you don't have a progressive disease, if you've got other therapies that you can be using in the meantime, but if you don't, and if the disease is progressing and you don't have any other therapies, this is obviously a tremendous blow. So these are the kind of challenges that we're working with under the current system. So what have we been trying to do here? We've been trying to actually work with the federal government and with the provincial governments to come up with a new system that actually works a lot better for rare disease drugs. Now, you might think that with all those barriers, we ought to just go home and give up on it. But luckily, as you heard from all the presentations here from the drug companies, from the clinicians, nobody's given up. And certainly what is special about the Duchesne community here is that the patients and the parents are not giving up. So based on that, we have actually been advocating for a new drug system. Let me sort of see. Well, actually, let me back up a little bit, because what we'd like to do, is there a backup on this? Yep. All right, okay. You can see all the different steps on the left. That can take many, many years to get a drug through. What we're looking at is the step on the right, that fast speed escalator. We want to get down from the time the drug is approved to the patients as quickly as possible, bypassing those many steps. So this is the proposal. I mean, just to let you know kind of where Canada's been since you can see that, you know, people talk about how expensive rare disease drugs are, and you saw some of the pricing that was there. Those are list prices. Or nobody actually pays those prices, but they are expensive. There's no doubt about it, right? You're talking about drugs for small population, talking about drugs that have a long development phase, and what you also know is you're talking about drugs that have a high failure rate. So every drug that comes to the market, and certainly in Duchesne, it's no exception, there have been hundreds, not and maybe even thousands that have gone through a development process and never got to the market. So it means that a company that's bringing a therapy is actually paying a whole lot more than just the cost of that drug. So we oftentimes feel, you know, like either there's a total lack of understanding when they say, well, you know, it doesn't cost that much to manufacture the drug. It costs a whole lot to have developed and get the drug there. But at the end of the day, because the number of patients is small, right? I mean, the reason these drugs are expensive because the number of patients that actually benefit from them and would be sharing that research and development costs are so small. So on a per patient basis, they're actually quite high. On an aggregate basis, the impact in terms of the drug budget is absolutely minuscule. It is so tiny that some people call it a rounding error because the number of patients that would benefit from it is so very, very small. Here you can see kind of what the expenditure is. And certainly the private sector pays for some of it. Here's what we're paying for other therapies and the what we pay in terms of rare disease drugs is less than, in many cases, depending on how you calculate it, somewhere between one and a half and 2% of the total drug spend. Even if every single drug that came in for a rare disease were actually funded in Canada, it would be no more than 6%. That really is not what you call a significant amount. So anybody that's telling you it's too expensive, the answer is it's not too expensive. The overall impact, and this is gonna break the budget, there's zero possibility that paying for a rare disease drug, paying for a drug, for a child with muscular dystrophy is gonna break anybody's drug budget. So, you know, this is something that we really need to make clear. This is not too expensive. It's not too much for Canada to be able to do. So what is happening? I mean, what we do know is that these innovative therapies are coming and there's more and more coming. And so what happens is that a lot of times drug plans look up and say, oh my God, all these drugs keep coming. I don't have a budget for them. And it's very true. They don't necessarily have the budget for them. And when they make the application for it, they actually do say, I don't have the room in my budget. Well, it's kind of true because you didn't budget for it. What we've been doing more of, and I know this is what you're doing with Duchenne, is we're going to these drug plans and saying ahead of time, here are the drugs that are coming. Here's how much they're going to cost. Here's what the impact on your budget is. I've often said to a drug plan manager, you know, I can fix your problem in terms of not having budget. Let me sit down with you and tell you what drugs are coming in for the next two years. You ask for a reasonable budget and suddenly you've got it. So this is what we're talking about. It isn't that the money isn't there, it's that the drug plan hasn't allocated that money into it because they haven't necessarily anticipated. The money is there, it's just in other places and it needs to be allocated over to it. So this is the challenge that we've got, is that we need to make sure. The other thing that's really important is to recognize 
these drugs are not cost centers. I'm going to stop using the word, quite frankly. We're going to quit talking about financing drugs. We're going to quit talk, talking about funding drugs. We're going to even quit talking about reimbursing drugs. It is not funding. It's not financing. It's not reimbursement. It's investment. Because if you invest in these drugs, you actually get a net return on that. And I think that's what we need to think about. We need to think about how are we investing in patients, in families, in clinics, in health services, because the short answer is just because you're not actually paying for these advances in therapy, it doesn't mean they aren't costing you. We know that, right? The fact is that there's tremendous cost, and it's not just the cost of the patients, it's the cost of the family, it's the cost to the whole society, it's the cost to the whole system. The other thing is that by investing in these, you actually advance a whole lot of other things. You advance research and development, you advance the, um, the advanced care, you advance the ability for parents and for people to go back to work, to actually be able to be contributing to society. So in many respects, we're not asking for a handout. We're asking the governments and we're asking the public plans to invest in the right way. It costs a lot. And somebody say, well, it's the cost of doing nothing. It's not the cost of doing nothing. It's the cost of putting monies into the wrong places and getting very little for it. And I always say as well, we know that there's a lot of money being spent in healthcare. There's a lot of money being spent in rare diseases, but it's all being spent in the wrong places. I mean, talk about the diagnosis. It takes up to seven years for a patient with a rare disease to get a diagnosis. Do you know how many times you go into the emergency room? Do you know how many times you go and see the uh, clinician? Do you know how many bad episodes a patient has within those seven years in which they don't get a diagnosis? Even if you don't get a treatment or a cure for that disease, having a right diagnosis automatically reduces the kind of unnecessary interventions you got. And it also prevents something really important and that is getting treated for the wrong disease. In many, many cases, patients get the wrong diagnosis, they get into a course of treatment, and sometimes that course of treatment not only does not do them any good, it actually harms them. And again, if we invest in the right places, upfront, early diagnosis, invest in newborn screening, invest in early understanding in terms of what the signs and symptoms of a rare condition are, we can intervene much more quickly. I mean, that's what we're looking for, a system that is willing to invest in the prevention. And we also know that the earlier you invest in getting access to the right treatment, the earlier you're going to be able to stop the progression of that treatment, the more health benefits you get. In the seven years that I've been advocating, as these patients progress, by the time we finally get an agreement on the table, guess what? You will be paying for the life of the patient but you're going to get significantly fewer health outcomes because that patient will progress in that seven years. So you're going to be paying for the rest of the life, but now you're going to actually be paying to get fewer outcomes and you're going to have much poorer quality of life for the patient. We've got to get the system turned around so that we're going to be able to intervene at the right time as soon as possible. We talked a little bit about how we're doing that, but that's what we're talking about in terms of looking at the drug system. What we're trying to do is to get an integrated program, and I'm going to skip over to talk about it. What we're proposing, so some of you may know, if you don't know, is that in 2019, the federal government made the announcement that they were willing to invest $1 billion in setting up a new rare disease drug strategy to be implemented in 2022-2023. And what they were willing to do was to make that investment. It was, well, it was a political promise. It was an election year, but we don't really care why they did it. It was good enough that they did it. Um, and, but what we then did was to try to do consultations with them over that ensuing year. Unfortunately, 2019, they made the announcement. They went into an election. They actually had a hold in terms of being able to do it with it. By 2020 in March, when we came back to do consultations to figure out how we're going to invest that $1 billion, COVID came. So we had two years where the government was doing nothing but focusing on COVID. And we basically said, as you said already, we can't wait. We cannot wait until COVID is over because our patients are still getting rare conditions. They're still progressing. So we're not gonna hold our breath until you get done with COVID. 
And as some patients have said to me, there's no way I'm going to die from COVID, but I can die from my rare disease if I don't get the proper treatment. So we began in court to do consultations. We've been consulting now for two and a half years. Many people here have been participating with, with that consultation. And we have actually, over that period of time, developed a framework, a framework for integrated care that would actually focus on not just getting a drug, but actually being able to provide comprehensive integrated care to patients with rare diseases. And we've come back to say to the government over and over again, we do not want you to invest a billion dollars in buying drugs. Because as you can see, even if you had a billion dollars, even if you had $500 million a year, which is what they're promising, you're not gonna buy a whole lot of drugs for a lot of people, not on that basis. It's not sustainable. What we want to do is invest in an infrastructure so that we can absolutely be able to have centers of excellence, care centers that are actually wrapped around the diagnosis of patients on a timely basis, an accurate diagnosis, getting every patient who has a rare disease to seeing the appropriate specialist, getting a network set up that we kind of call the hub and spoke model where you've got hubs that are centers, but you've got spokes there that are close to care at home. So for many people to be able to have a local clinician, a local healthcare provider who's supported by a specialist to be able to deliver care close to home. Those are the kinds of initiatives. And then also to have ongoing monitoring of these patients. The most important aspect for us in the drug system is being able to have a system in place where we can begin to say, we want you to make these drugs available as soon as possible, even if we're not absolutely sure how well they're going to work, well they're going to work for that specific patient and how well they're going to work over a long period of time. Public systems are very loath to invest in services and therapies that they consider to have what they call high uncertainty. We're not sure who it works for. We're not sure how well it's going to work. We're not sure how long it's going to work. So when they're faced with what they call that uncertainty, and sometimes those clinical trials, as you know, are very short, small number of people, very highly specialized in terms of the patient populations, it is hard to extrapolate. And you heard all the research there, right? Unless you are really exactly like that target population that was in the clinical trials, what the plan says is, I'm not sure if it's going to work for you if you're older, if you're more progressed if you have a slightly different variation, is that going to work for you? And your clinician might say, and even the regulator might say, we think it will work. The reimbursers should say, we don't want to pay for it because we're not sure it worked. And if we're not sure it's going to work, then we might be wasting some monies there. So what we want to propose is a program by which many countries are using called a manage access program. And this program then starts with off with the financing. The idea is that we take some of that money and we put it into a drug budget. And what that drug budget can help do is that as these therapies come to the countries, come to market, come to clinics, even if there's high uncertainty around them, what we want to say is that we would like to make them available to the patients under a monitored program. Normally, with clinical trials, you would say, okay, let's do the clinical trials for another five or six years. Let's enroll, you know, a couple thousand patients. By the time they come to the market, we have some certainty in terms of how well they're going to work, who they're going to work for. Well, guess what? We don't have five or six years. We don't have a couple thousand patients, right? So this is not going to work. What we want to be able to do is we will take that patient and the drug plans often say to us, we don't have the monies. We didn't budget for it. That's fine. We have a finance plan here. We can start the patient. And we can get the drug companies to help us start the patient. They can contribute to it. And we will monitor that patient. The sensible thing to do is we start the patient and we identify what would indicate if the drug is working. And if it doesn't necessarily turn into automatic, you know, kind of benefits in terms of visible symptom management benefits, but it will turn into biomarker benefits. You can, you've already heard a lot of the research about it. Clinicians, companies know what to monitor to see if it works, if it's not working. If it works, we keep the patient on the drug. And over the time that it demonstrates it works, we get the drug plan to pick up the cost. If it doesn't work, guess what we do? What would you do if you were on a drug that really clearly didn't work? What would you do? Do you want to stay on this drug? You want to keep taking it no matter what, especially if it's challenging, especially if it has adverse effects to it? Of course not. We take the patient off, we begin to look for something else, right? So this is the proposal, and it's such a sensible proposal. And you wonder why it isn't being used. 
I mean, part of the reason it isn't being used is that the plans come back and say, we have no way of really monitoring the patients. We don't have a system in place. If you think about it, you are so fortunate in muscular dystrophy. You're so fortunate in Duchenne. You have clinicians that are very much involved with you, working with you, and providing ongoing monitoring support. But even they are not able to provide you with 24-hour monitoring management. Even they are not able to capture all the information in terms of how well therapy is working for you. So we need to have patient platforms. We need to have better registries that allow us to capture that information reliably on a go-for-it basis. So that's part of what we're proposing in this new drug strategy. So again, I go back to saying we're not just funding the drug. We need to fund the whole system in which the drug is going to be made available so that we can then say, OK, we can manage this patient. We can be able to monitor how well it's working. We kind of do it in oncology, right? You go in, you get chemo, you go in, you get radiation. Nobody says, OK, you've gotten it. We'll see you in two weeks. We'll see you in six months. They actually bring you back in in two or three days. They measure how well it's working. And if it's working well, they keep giving you chemo. If it isn't working, they take you off chemo, and they either try something else or they go into a different form of treatment. That's all we're asking for. We're asking for that same level of really focused monitoring. We're also asking for some of that monitoring to be done by the patients and the families. You need to become a part of this ongoing treatment. You need to monitor and manage the symptoms. You need to report back when there's an adverse event. You need to report back how well it's working. You need to become part of that ongoing system. And this is, again, what we're setting up. The financing has to be there so that we can provide some of the resources in the clinics. The financing has to be there so we can start these therapies. But that's only one part of it, right? We also have to have the clinical, and we also have to have the infrastructure. And this is a huge part of it. And you know, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Ward are really two of my key people that are going to be helping us move forward on setting up across the country a network of centers of excellence so that we can actually have rare diseases that are what we imagine kind of what oncology has, right? There's cancer centers right across the country. If you have cancer, you don't just wander into anybody. And if you even have cancer and it's identified you know, by a local healthcare professional, they hopefully refer you to a cancer specialist and you get picked up then in terms of that ongoing care. We want to do even better than what oncology is doing. And we can do better. One, we have really dedicated you know, expert clinicians. But beyond that, we've got really a dedicated network of patients and families that can be involved in it. So setting up centers of excellence, building them on the current systems, centers that we have, the pediatric centers, the specialty networks that, you know, Dr. Ward, Dr. Campbell have already talked to you about, the, uh, the, um, the kinds of centers that uh, Dr. McAdams talking about at Holland Blue Review. We have a lot of these resources in place. We just don't properly and, and completely fund them, and we don't network them together so that we can ensure that every patient, regardless of where they are, can get access to them. So that's the whole idea as well. And then we need to have proper governance. We need to provide the oversight into it. The most important thing in that governance is we want to make sure it's patient inclusive, that patients, patient organizations, patient networks are absolutely part of the governance of this system. And this is something that everybody talks about, but we want to build it in very strongly into the system because we know that if the patients are helping to direct the system, it's going to actually work for us. So the overall goal is what you look at it here. I mean, the goal is that actually we've got that little cube shows like what we're doing currently and what we're doing in terms of providing access to therapies. What we need to be able to do is expand that cube. We need to have more patients involved. We need to have them involved earlier, and we need to have more conditions that will be involved. And we can only do that if we can demonstrate that there is a value added to it, that we can demonstrate that if we invest in these, that they actually will be contributing back to the overall economic health, not only of the individuals, but also of the families, of, of the system. This is something that we're needing to work at, I mean, because Sadly, I mean, well, it's not sadly, it's realistically, things do work on the basis of the economy. So what we're trying to do then is expand the small system that we've got now to make sure that there are more that are going to be involved, but we need to do it responsibly. We need to do it in a way that's demonstrated in terms of added value here. This is kind of what we're looking for as well. I just talked to you about it. We need to make sure that we're able to get these medicines fast-tracked and approved early. We can't wait. And in some respects, we've got some systems in place that are doing that now, especially at Health Canada. They're absolutely good right now in terms of being able to approve therapies, gene therapies coming in. We actually can get 
much faster approvals than we used to in the past. What we don't have is how do we develop these managed access programs. And that means we have to start way before the therapies even start to come in to sit down with companies, sit down with clinicians to say, as you're doing right now, these drugs are coming. But what you're going to prepare for is not just advocacy to get access to them. You're going to prepare the clinics inside to say, how do we manage them? How do we identify which patients are going to be on the therapies? How do we make sure that we've got systems in place that we can absolutely keep track of that patient information and be able to calculate how well they're working? This is really essential. And what, what are we looking for in terms of measures? Those are things we have to uh, work on. We have to make sure that we've got fair prices, sustainable health care budgets. That's a balance, right? What's a fair price? And what's the budget that we need to allocate for it? I mean, somewhere in between there is kind of where the magic lies, you know? Probably not as much as the drug companies want, probably a lot more than the drug plans want to pay for it, the healthcare system wants to pay for it, some of that. But we need to negotiate that up front. What we're doing right now is that we negotiate that each and every time that a new drug comes into the system and it gets approved. And that's why it takes sometimes up to seven years to get a drug to get access. And I always say, you know, I don't know what's more frustrating to be in a position where there's no therapy or to be in a position where you know there's a therapy and guess what, you can't get it. And you can't get it because they're fighting over how much they want to pay for it. I mean, this is what we absolutely have to avoid. And you're starting well now. You've got a whole lot of drugs in that pipeline. What's going to be a managed access program around each and where of them? How do we identify? Can we diagnose quickly who needs to will qualify for it? Can we identify quickly which patients that we need to monitor and what are we going to monitor for to ensure whether or not the drug is working and they should stay on it? What are the long-term outcomes that we're going to look for and be able to calculate back as to how well that drug is making a return on the investment? Those are the kind of things you need to put into place now. And it's absolutely essential as you're looking at the whole lot of drugs that are coming through. And then obviously for patients to be involved in every step along that way. And that means individuals, not just the patient groups. So what we're looking at here is always kind of laugh, you know, what is the future going to look like for rare diseases, you know, in the post world, uh, in a post pandemic m m world. I mean, in some respects, we might think, okay, the pandemic's over, we kind of go back and everybody's where we started from and we'll kind of look at rare diseases as fighting for a space. Part of it could be that, you know, unfortunately, you know, even though some people officially declared the pandemic is over, it's kind of not over. We still have emergency room problems. We still have the possibility now RSV coming in. We have all kinds of respiratory disease. Are we going to be continuously having new crises that are going to outweigh what we're trying to do in rare diseases? This is not just our problem in Canada. This is something globally. Can we compete with other healthcare crises or other crises? I was just recently on a global panel where we talked about you know, healthcare for chronic conditions in a crisis world. We got climate crisis, right? Where are the resources going? We've got conflict crisis and the fight for, you know, being able to reduce some of the conflicts, not just in Ukraine, but in many other environments. And definitely we have still, you know, ongoing somewhat of a COVID crisis, right? So where do, how do we make sure that we don't get squeezed out? as health systems and governments start to go after crisis after crisis saying, you know what, we can't get to you. That was our concern way back in 2020. They said, well, we'll get to you when we get done with COVID. Our answer was, we can't wait that long. We don't want to wait for you. Because post COVID, you're going to have a different crisis. You know, we need to be in charge and we need to move it forward. So what's it going to be like? The best new scenario, I think, is that we will see rare diseases as actually being able to lead the world in terms of research and development, in terms of innovations. You heard all the therapies that are being developed for, you know, Duchenne. And you need, I mean, you probably do know, many of those therapies are based on technologies that were developed for other diseases and for other kinds of, you know, prevention. But many of the advances that are being made for rare diseases are actually going to turn into therapies for a whole host of other diseases. And that's what's happening. I mean, when we talk about the vaccines with mRNA technologies, we know we had mRNA therapies for rare diseases way before the vaccines. We talk about gene therapies that are gonna be important for all kinds of chronic diseases. We're pioneering those in the rare diseases. So a lot of the technologies that we're talking about are coming out of rare diseases. And if we continue to sponsor and to foster it, and the reason why rare disease is so important, and you think about this as an advantage, you're a small patient population. 
they can go in and actually identify the right patients for a specific therapy, and they can tell whether it's working or not. If you talk about cardiovascular disease, you think about diabetes, that's a huge diffuse population. You cannot do that same kind of targeting that you're able to do with a rare disease. A proof of concept in a diabetes world is really hard to do. A proof of concept in a Duchenne world, we can make that happen, and we can make it happen in a short period of time. So do not kind of back away from thinking that, okay, we're just costing the system a whole lot of money, and that you know we're just a small patient population, so there isn't a whole lot of public benefit. What's happening in rare diseases is absolutely proving the way. And the biggest thing is proving the way is, is that, as you know, in many of the common diseases, they're starting to look at genetic markers. They're starting to look at some of the same things that you're talking about in terms of the genetic defects that have led to the diseases and neuromuscular diseases. We're now identifying those kinds of mutations, not those specific mutations, but other mutations. So that we're looking at, as everybody says, cancer is no longer cancer, right? Cancer is a whole lot of very targeted diseases. Well, we're pioneering the way for the, the ability to actually identify targeted their cancers and to be able to treat targeted cancers with some of the work that's being done for rare diseases. So this is absolutely a filler and a feeder industry for diseases that are going to be much more common. And at the end of the day, people will know if I can provide a, specific, a very targeted therapy for a very specific type of cancer or cardiovascular disease or you know metabolic disease, and I can actually cure that disease or prevent that disease, it's going to be highly cost effective. The same thing applies to us here in the rare diseases. That's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Durhan. Um, your passion and your wealth of knowledge is just amazing and critical. And we thank you for all the work that, that you're doing. And, you know, I think that from you know, for, for our community, for the Duchenne community, um, at the end of the day, it's all about sharing those stories. Your stories are so critical to all of this work that's happening, whether it's your story about your diagnosis. I know a lot of families who have really gone through a long journey before getting that diagnosis. That's an important story to tell. Maybe it's the story about the, you know, how you're managing the disease, the burden of, of managing Duchenne, the impact that it's had on the family. Um, there are so many families who have had to uh, cut down on their jobs, so like part-time jobs, some families that have had to stop working. So you've gone from two income family to a one income family because uh, one of those members has to become a full-time caregiver. These are all important stories to share. And there's different ways to share that. And I understand that there's a comfort level as well. So some families are willing to share and, and talk to people about it and other families aren't, and that's okay too. And there is um, different ways that you can contribute to this. And if you're not sure how you can contribute, please reach out um, and talk to us and we can figure out a way to do that. And maybe your contribution is uh, making sure that you're part of the registry, the CNDR registry. Like you know that your information is, is contributing to, uh, to a registry. That might be uh, an important, a really important contribution and, and um, uh, one way to do that. So as we continue and, and advance our work in this area, um, you know, we, um, we're, we're just so happy to part be partnering with, with CORD as well as other organizations who are going through this, other rare diseases that are, have been going through this for some time. Um, and a lot of the work that we're going to be doing in a couple of weeks from now, it's going to be learning from some of those organizations so that we can really put together a solid plan of getting the awareness of Duchenne out there into our community, but also politically as well. So. Um, are, there, are there any questions, by the way, that's... Anyone? I, as you know, this is an area of uh, <clears throat> passion for me, too. Yeah. And um, I have a couple questions. And one is, Durhan, I know in, on the, on the, on the uh, multiple stairs and the slide, we talked about the provincial issue, but I'm not sure the families fully appreciate all of the things that you talked about even when the drug is approved to be paid for, there are still other steps before they have access. Could you just touch on that very briefly? Yeah, and I think it depends. 
sorry, I'm going to destroy your microphone here. It depends on what you mean by approved to be paid for, right? Well, yeah. Um, because, as you know, um, there are many agencies that are involved in Canada. We have one of the most complex systems in the world. Don't think that everybody has this kind of a cumbersome system. So our public drug plans are highly complex. And so even if they get approved, as Rick says, we know by the regulator, even if they get approved for reimbursement, one of the things, as I said, is that they may approve them, but they will put such a huge, huge caveat on how much they're willing to pay that companies are really unable to come to any kind of good negotiation. So this is a big problem. Certainly in Canada as well, you know, you've got private drug plans. We used to think that, okay, if you had a private drug plan and a drug comes in, it'll get you can get reimbursed. Now we're finding it's not the case. We've had many denials. Private drug plans will say, well, that's a pre-existing condition, so we don't pay for pre-existing condition like the, you know. Uh, they'll say that, you know what, this is not something that we are comfortable with until it's actually got, been picked up by the public drug plans. So my question is, so what good is a private drug plan? Why am I paying for private drug coverage if you're not going to do anything until the public picks it up? And as you know, with many of these rare conditions, even if you have a private drug plan, the co-pays can be exorbitant. Now, luckily, in many cases, we can work with the drug companies to actually help to negotiate those co-pays, but that's not a straight flow through, right? And even if there is an agreement signed, what they call a letter of intent, so finally the pricing agencies finally get together and say, okay, we agree, we will pay, here's the price we'll pay, it still has to go to each and every province to say, we will actually list it. We will make it available. So this is another big chance. And even if they do that, I know this sounds like a mountain that you're climbing, they will put so many conditions on it. I mean, to be honest, we don't want these drugs on an open list formulary, right? We don't want it so that any doctor out there could actually prescribe your drugs. You don't want that. You do want it to be conditional and it's going to be prescribed by a specialist can actually monitor it. But sometimes they make it so challenging that the clinicians, I mean, we know clinicians have written 12, 13 times the submissions to get approval. And sometimes one clinician will get approved with the same letter and another clinician will say no to without any real reason as to why. There's no transparency. There's no accountability in terms of what's happening. We have to change that. That's why we say we need to have patients involved in each and every step of the way. And what we really need to make the case is the longer you delay, the less likely it is that you're going to be able to provide the optimal benefit to that patient. And I think that's something that we have to say over and over again, you know, and that's why I say I want to call it an investment. It's an investment in the person. It's an investment in terms of the family. It's an investment into that health system. And the more and the earlier that we can do it, the more we're going to get out of that return on the investment. But you're right. There's so many steps along the way. And you know, it's, uh, we will hear sometimes from a family that says, I managed to get it from my whatever, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to carry over to somebody else. So again, we need to make sure that the systems are right there in place. And the other thing we've heard is, um, and, and we've seen, at least I've seen, and, and, and maybe it's just because it's always constantly on my radar, but more and more articles from credible individuals organizations and media that the system is broken it isn't cracked it's broken have are you do you, are you confident we've got a system the plan can work in the existing system or do we need to push for bigger changes so this is where i think we've got a real opportunity here so Health Canada came forth and said, we'll give you a billion dollars to set up a drug strategy. We're going to give you $500 million a year to keep it going. And when they first came back to us, they said, we want to fund a list of drugs. They actually called it really weird. They called it rare disease drugs of common interest. Like, what the hell is that? <laughs> like, my drug is no, not common to anybody else's drug, so we have no idea what they're talking about. What are you talking about? You know, aspirin? Like, what's of common interest? Anyway, we kind of came back and said, no, that doesn't make any sense. We don't want you to do that. Um, and then they come back and said, okay, we'll fund a specified list of drugs. 
And we kind of say, well, that doesn't make any sense either, because how we're going to get new drugs in and innovate, and who decides what's on that list or not? Because $500 million a year is not going to fund everybody. And what we kept saying over and over again, back to your question of the system, we need to make real changes in the infrastructure. We need to make sure, as you say, that we get diagnosed as quickly as possible, that we have awareness in the community of what these possible conditions are, and if the condition is actually diagnosable, we want to be able to get diagnosis. We want to get the patient to a specialist, and that specialist is going to be the one that's going to be able to absolutely move forward. You're lucky. You've got specialists. Not every, as you know, patient is going to have as access to a specialist. So we need to, so we, yeah, we recognize the system is broken, but guess what? We don't have to fix the whole system. We only have to fix the rare disease system. So we're looking at a small microcosm. We're looking with, C with C Craig and with Leanne to say, let us create centers of excellence for rare diseases. Let us look at these specialty networks for rare diseases. I'll, hopefully, the rest of the system gets fixed. And I really want it to get fixed for everybody else as well. But right now, I have an opportunity to really fix the system for rare diseases. And the good news is, after two and a half, three years of advocacy, they did finally come to us about three weeks ago. And this is why I'm so excited about this conference coming up. And they finally said, I, I still had an aside with the aid to the minister. And I said, is the minister still stuck on wanting to fund illicit drugs? Is PharmaCare what he's talking about? And he said, no, the minister heard you. We're gonna invest in three things. We're gonna invest in infrastructure. We're gonna invest in diagnosis. We're gonna invest in research. And I said, oh, my God, here, here, had an aside with the minister. Actually, I kind of bullied my way into it. The minister was doing there, was going to do a photo op. He had a whole bunch of really important people standing there with him. I kind of wormed my way in there, stuck out my hand, said, really, minister, I would like to thank you for all the work that you're doing for us. He looked at me. <laughs> he didn't look at me and say, who the hell are you? He did look at me and say, thank you very much. He says, you are doing an important job for us. You're keeping us on track. We need you to continue to do what you're doing. So. We have a lot of faith, and we've actually talked now with the bureaucrats who are initially saying we don't know what we're going to do to basically say we got it. This is where we're moving. So we're very excited by the fact that we think we've got the system moving in that right direction with the investment. And we're actually pointing to the private sector to say, come on board with us, provide your investment as well. We know they will. So this is where we're going. So I think we've actually made a major breakthrough. I've also had people say to me, where's the place that gets the best rare disease you know, treatment in the world? And I said, nobody. Everybody has struggles with it. But if we do this right, it can be Canada. So we're trying to move Canada to the top of the list. And you folks are the ones. You know, and Nicola and Rick and Perry are the ones, you know, they're helping us move there. So we're counting on all of you to kind of get us there. And as Nicola says, you got to be involved. You got to put your voice in. You got to step up in whatever way you can. Because what they heard and what the government heard was not me. What they heard was the community saying very strongly, we are agreed that this is what it needs to look like. And that's what they heard. So. Durhan, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Duchenne community um, and the, all of us at Defeat Duchenne Canada. You've always taken the time to chat with us and Nicole and I met with you for about an hour in Toronto back in late August as we were talking about the importance of advocacy and what we need to do as a community. Um, and I can't stress enough the importance of your story at whatever stage it is in the disease. The one thing I want to come back to is what we've been doing and what we're going to continue doing with your support. Um, we will never leave you alone in these types of meetings that we're having. Tomorrow, Nicola and I are sitting down with a cabinet minister from Burlington with a family to share their story. Um, and it's really about these one-to-one -one stories that we're having with MPs. There's a real power in our voice rising up but not being loud and obnoxious. We have a very a simple message. It's about access to treatments first. Um, there are other parts of the story, obviously, but um, you sharing your story is gonna have a huge impact. And so if you're interested in this work, please come and talk to us. We will make sure that there's an outcome report of the meeting in Ottawa in a couple weeks. This, as Nicola said, is a select group in terms of those who were early on interested. And that's really where we began with this. So this is the beginnings of us putting some investment into advocacy more than ever before, because it's for your benefit and the benefit of our boys in terms of moving this forward and having access. There's a lot of work going on and you're paying a steep price. 
and time is muscle, as Nicola has said. And um, so we're going to move this forward. We need your support, and we want to work with you and support you in sharing your stories. So just wanted to make sure that we circled back on that because this is framed around you. Um, and that's the work that we want to do. I cannot echo that enough. Without the individual patient, none of this matters. Really, and what they see and they have to hear is you coming forth and saying, this matters to me and here's why it matters. And you doing that one-on-one -on -one is absolutely the most important fundamental aspect of what we're doing. Thank you, Durham. Okay. Just one question online. Yes. Somebody asked, if there's a clinical trial in Canada, does that mean that you automatically get access to that drug? Wow, that's a number one question. There are many types of clinical trials, and certainly advances have been made in terms of those clinical trial agreements, right? It really is up to the company. Most companies have entered into some form of an ethical agreement. Once upon a time, it meant nothing, right? But it does mean now, in many cases, two things to remember. One is that if you're in a clinical trial and the drug is absolutely working and is absolutely on the road to be able to become reimbursed in Canada, the company, most cases, will keep you on that therapy. They don't have to. There's nothing that says you have to. In many other cases, as you know, if you're in a placebo trial and you're in the placebo arm and that drug is deemed to be working, at some stage in that trial, they can also cross you over to actually getting the treatment without messing up the outcome. So know that you have the right to actually ask for that. And even after the trial is over, if you've been in the placebo arm, you at least can ask about it because you have contributed and you have participated and your data have actually helped to make that drug marketed. So you should be able to benefit from it. It is not like, oh my gosh, I got the wrong end of the stick. And we've heard so many advances there. Um, the company that, I can't remember which one it says, you had two brothers, right? And if one of them is in the trial, you know, I will not leave the other one out. We have so many cases in the past where we've had two brothers. And then someone, I remember one of the Duchesne one, two brothers. One of the brothers said, I give up my space to my brother because he's absolutely in better shape than me, he's going to benefit more from it, or they, it's the other way around. So now we're seeing a lot of the ethics of it. So yes, you can make that ethical argument, and you need to do it, but it's not written anywhere that it has to be that way, but we can, we can make the, the case. Just, I just wanted to add to that as well, too, from, from the family perspective around clinical trials. Um, because a clinical trial is getting run whether it's at, happens to be at your center or in Canada, doesn't necessarily mean that you will get either in the trial or get access to that type of medication um, because there's screening that's involved in that, in that process. The other piece is that just a reminder for everybody that the reason they're doing the clinical trials is because they want to understand whether the drug works and whether it's for, for most importantly, if it's safe. And so we don't even know that these drugs are still investigational and we've even had instances in canada and not not just in canada worldwide where we've had um molecules that have come through clinical trial and have failed so and and there's boys who have been enrolled in those trials that unfortunately they have to come off that treatment and those trials are discontinued and so now we have to wait for the next opportunity that comes by. So when we talk about clinical trials as having access to drug, it, it isn't access to a drug. In some cases, it might be if there is a drug that's approved in another country, and we are very fortunate to have a company who is willing to continue to run a clinical trial in a country that doesn't have access um, to that drug uh, because they need to gather more data and more evidence to support the risk benefit profile of that drug, um, then that's a great opportunity for our community too. But there are restrictions around clinical trials and unfortunately the reality of that is not everyone gets access to that, right? The challenge again, as you know with Duchenne, is that there are so many variations on it and there are so many therapies that are out there. And, you know, and it may be very weary to say, okay, we have to keep trying, we have to keep stepping forward. But honestly, God, nobody has done a better job worldwide than the Duchesne families. I mean, the ability at a global level to have been, been able to, number one, do what you've done here and bring all of those 
groups together. You've been in many of those international meetings. The community is absolutely not only working together, they take in charge because they're also the ones that are actually making the recommendations as to which trial should advance, which patient should step forward and say, this is the right trial for me. Because if there's five trials, how do you know which one should be going into? You know, and you don't automatically get another chance because being in one trial, it may be, as you say, you need to wait. On the other hand, there may have been something within that trial that would make it so you're not gonna be eligible for another trial. Mm -hmm. And certainly in gene therapy, that's the case as well, is that we oftentimes have to be very, very careful that if, in fact, you enter into a trial for gene therapy, if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll get access to another gene therapy trial, and it certainly may not mean you'll get access to any other therapy. So we have to trust in the, your organizations, trust in your patient groups. They're the ones that are doing all the hard work to help filter through you know, what should be, you know, available or not, and which patients should be going where. And I do not know of any other community of rare diseases in the world that has done the work that muscular dystrophy has. So you're really very, very lucky because this is community. I mean, the sad news is that the reason you're so good at it, and you've been so good at it, is you've been at it so long. I mean, we look at people that have been there since the beginning, right? And, you know, it's many years of of experience that have got you at this point, but take advantage of it. And one last question online. If a drug is, is approved by Health Canada, does that guarantee access in the provinces? And if not, why not? A drug being approved by Health Canada, as I think Nicola was saying, is approved on the two things, right? It's safe, it's not gonna kill you. <laughs> two, the benefits for that particular patient population that was in that clinical trial outweighed the risks. There are benefits and there are risks. That's all Health Canada said. Now it has to go through a very long, complicated appraisal process that's going to look at, okay, how good were those benefits and for which patient population, even though the clinical trial was there. You've got the group of health technology assessment, CADA, that's going to look at it. The pricers are going to look at it and say, is the price that's being asked for it a reasonable price? Does it fit the kind of benefits that we think? Your drug plans are going to look at it and say, how much impact is going to have on my budget? How many people are going to be affected? How much money room that I have in my budget? And you're absolutely going to look at what are the long-term benefits? Health Canada says that drug looked good based on the clinical evidence. That drug was not in clinical trials for 10 years. And your reimbursers are going to look at it and say, if I'm paying for it, what's going to be the impact 10 years down the road? I have no idea. So we need to work through each and every one of those stages and those questions. So unfortunately, getting regulatory approval is only the very first step.